Uh, we begin today a series called Blueprint. Now, for some of you, you are discouraged to hear that. You're disappointed to hear that because we've been in Psalms, the book of Psalms this summer, and you're saying, like, I love the book of Psalms. Can we stay in Psalms? Good news for you is two weeks from now, uh, I'll be back and I'll be preaching Psalms again, okay? It's not, it's in this series, but I will be going from a Psalm. So we're, we're just going to keep going after the Psalms because they have been so powerful this summer. But we are starting a series called Blueprint. If you have the worship folder, you'll see on the front of this uh, a blueprint, I suppose, an image of Henry James School. And uh, later this month, we're going to be moving to Henry James. Uh, if you were with us in the springtime, uh, we were there for seven weeks. And we're going to launch there this fall. And uh, we will be there until the Lord uh, changes the plans or uh, directs us otherwise. But that's where we're going. And uh, as we move to Henry James, I wanted to take some time over the next three weeks to just review the blueprint of our church. The blueprint is the design plan or the structural model for a building. We have some builders in the house here today. They could probably come up and give me a much more specific definition of the blueprint. But if you've ever built anything, particularly something that's you know, significant where you're cutting wood and you're you know, uh, getting it up there, if you don't follow the blueprint, or maybe if you don't have a blueprint, uh, what can happen is you can put a lot of time in and then find out things don't really work out. And that is a shame. In fact, some of you are living in homes where you have found that maybe the builder should have followed the blueprint a little bit more because uh, things are falling apart, right? So we have a blueprint for our church, a design for the church. We've sort of been building it over the last few years. And uh, some of you uh, you know, are newcomers, and so maybe you don't understand all of this, and and uh, even others of us have a tendency to look towards a building, a space, a location, and particularly when we move into something like the auditorium at Henry James, we start to think that's church. And I just want to declare it today, we will do church, they're a part of church, but that is not church. The church, and we've said this from the beginning, is more about people than it is about place. It's about the people of God coming together to worship God and join the mission of God for the glory of God. Amen. And so as we look at Blueprint, our Blueprint's pretty, I'm just going to go real simple over the next three weeks, and our Blueprint can be summed up in its simplest form in three phrases are six words, and it is this, life together, on mission, for God's glory. Excuse me, seven words. Um, life together, on mission, for God's glory. And this is the uh, motto, I suppose, that we have for Valley Simsbury Church, that, that, you know, when we think about our church, when people ask me, hey, tell me about your church, what do I tell them? I tell them, hey, we're about three things, doing life together, uh, uh, joining the mission of God and doing it all for the glory of God because there's nothing better that we could do in our lifetime than to do all things to the glory of God that he would be worshipped because he's the only one that can save people. And so that's ultimately what we're here for. That's what we're doing this for. And so what I want to do today is I want to start with life together. Just talk about what does this mean as we think about um, the dimensions of this uh, blueprint. Now, if we think about it in three dimensions, we look at uh, life together being the relationships inwardly, okay? It's, it's you and me and us. Life together is, uh, I guess, looking at relationships that occur uh, in our church family towards one another. The mission part of it is relationships that occur then to those that are not part of the, church, the family of God, that we join the mission of God so that it's not just about us, but that we're going out, we're joining the mission of God, which means sent, and we'll talk about that next week. We're sent to be the hands and feet of Jesus and to love the world. And then finally, it's for God's glory, right? It's the vertical aspect that this is all, the life together and the mission is all about God's glory, knowing him, walking with him, and being with him. 
And uh, just a week ago, or actually a few weeks ago, uh, we the trailer, our trailer over there is going to get uh, a, a facelift in just a couple weeks, and they're going to wrap it or partially wrap it. And it's kind of funny because we took the words life together, and we put them big on the trailer along with some other words. And some people saw the graphic, and they thought that it initially said living together. And we were kind of like, well, actually, living together is not our hope. Right, you know that's not what we're about. We're about life together. So we adjusted the graphics, made it bigger. So that's going to get um, you know built up, and it'll let people know that we're meeting at Henry James. But again, our church is so much more about the place. It's about the people of God coming together. And so I want to look at that today. Life. What is life together? And I want to look at it from three angles. And so the first question is, what did Jesus say? Second, what does this look like? What did this look like for the early church? What did life together look like for the early church? And then finally, what does it look like today as we live this? And so let's begin with what did Jesus say? Or maybe what did Jesus pray when it comes to this whole concept of life together? And we won't look up the scripture because I guess, I think most of you know this scripture, but the Lord's Prayer I was pondering the, the, it this past week and praying it, and, and uh, Jesus, you know, taught people to pray. And he said, this is how you should pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so Jesus taught us to pray that his kingdom would come on this earth as it is in heaven, that the kingdom would come and his will would be done. And so one of our prayers is that God's kingdom would take root here in Simsbury and in Canton and in Granby and Burlington and Farmington and Avon and all the other towns that I didn't mention, New Hartford, right, that we want to see God's kingdom take root here and be present that we should pray for this uh, as it is in heaven that it would happen here on earth. The kingdom of God is manifested by the people of God living under the rule and reign of God for the glory of God. And so as we, God's people, come together and we live in lives together uh, under the rule and reign of God for his glory, we are evidencing uh, the kingdom of God. And Jesus wants us to pray for this. It's not just about salvation. It's about his kingdom, that his kingdom would fill this earth. And the question is, well, what does that life look like? What, the, what does it look like to do life together, to, to be the local presence of heaven on earth here? And that's where I want to go today. I want to look at life together and I want to possibly get to three passages. We may just get to two, uh, which I believe demonstrate what this life should look like. What does life look like together? What did it look like for them, the early Christians, and what does it look like for us today? So we're going to start in Acts chapter 2. We're going to read verses 42 through 47. And this is the first church, if you will. This is uh, after Pentecost. Uh, 3,000 believers come to Christ and they start to organize themselves and start to live as the people of God, the local presence of the kingdom of God. And this is how it describes them. We'll start reading in verse 42 again of chapter 2. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together. They had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. 
Now, this is a community of people, some 3,000 people, not exactly sure how they organize, doesn't give us all the details. Often the scriptures don't give us all the details, probably because if it gave us all the details, we would probably try to recreate the exact same thing, but that doesn't really work in the context of life as culture changes and governments changes. And so it's given us enough principles that we can build the local presence of the kingdom of God here for this time in this place. And it tells us, first of all, that this was an everyday community. As you think about like, what does the kingdom of God look like? It's an everyday community. It says that they were gathering uh, on the weekends for in the temple courts, or, or maybe even during the week, the week in the temple courts, but they were also in homes. They were sharing food together. They were eating meals together. They were supporting one another. They were praying together. And I suppose the principle that I would want us all to understand about this is that church is not a weekend event. It's an everyday lifestyle. If you want to be the glorious local presence of God's kingdom, his church, which the world desperately needs. It cannot just be a Sunday event in your life. It's an everyday lifestyle. And you say, well, what does that mean? Does that mean I'm having people over to my house every single day? Um, I don't think so, although maybe that would be admirable. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm part of, uh, let me just talk about prayer for just a moment. I'm part of at least three prayer threads, text message threads. There's uh, one that is uh, uh, part of a men's group that I'm part of. There's another uh, thread that is uh, a prayer group. It's a group of uh, about 19 or sometimes more people that are just praying for things that are going on in Valley Simsbury, our church family. There's also a uh, dinner group or neighbor group uh, aligned with the neighbor group, and we're constantly texting one another. And sometimes the texts are, hey, I need someone to pick up our kids. Sometimes life's falling apart right now. I, have no, I don't know what to do. Could someone take our kids today? And it's so amazing to just see, you know, uh, there's some days where it's like, man, we, we have no margin, but some of the other families are like, hey, we're home. Send your kids over. Uh, there's days in the prayer threads where people are just reaching out and saying, there are things going on with my kids today, uh, and, and I have no uh, control over what's happening. Can you guys just start praying? And we're just praying for one another. See, church, and, and you know, in my opinion, that is like when real church, the kind of church that we all desire happens is that we're more in relationships with one another, and that we're supporting each other and coming to each other. Someone last week said, hey, I need a ride to, to drop my car off to get fixed. Can someone bring me home? I mean, it's life together. Uh, this was a, if we look in Acts chapter 2, an everyday community. Second, it was a generous community. It says that they sold possessions and provided for those in need. Someone drove in this morning in a car, and I was like, hey, is that your new car? And he's like, no, it's someone else's car, part of the congregation here. And he was like, yeah, our car, well, actually, I didn't hear the whole story, but I think their car wasn't working, and so he just reached out to someone down the road, and he's driving their car. Uh, I know another uh, circumstance uh, a month or two ago where there was um, a pretty significant situation financially with someone and their car and someone else, part of our congregation, uh, said, like, I'll pay a significant amount of money uh, to solve the problem with the car, like in the four digits amount. And uh, I can just tell you over the past years, I don't know, three, four years of Valley Sims, where I remember there was a time where there was a family where the breadwinner or the person that made the money that drove the family had to stop working for a time. And there were groups of people that came together and said, we will give so much money every month to support this family. I mean, this is life together. And this is how 
they lived. It was an everyday community. It was a generous community. Uh, thirdly, it was a devoted community. They were devoted, they, it says that they were devoting themselves to the word of God, fellowship, uh, the Lord's Supper, and prayer. And so they weren't just sort of saying, hey, if it fits into the schedule, I'll, I'll be there. They were kind of like, no, 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 we're going to build the schedule around the family and around doing life together. Uh, they were devoted to knowing the word of God. And here it says to the apostles' teachings, but the apostles' teachings were written down, which then made up the New Testament. It's an oversimplification, but go with me there. What they're saying is we were devoted to the word, to knowing the word, to teaching the word to those that were young. And, uh, and we were coming together and we were breaking bread and we were um, remembering the Lord and engaging in fellowship. And finally, and maybe more important than any of this, okay, they were an everyday community, they were a generous community, they were a devoted community, but more important than anything else is this community, which this separates the church from everything else, every other amazing community in the world today. And there's some amazing communities that do these things. But this last thing separates it. You know what it was? They were a spirit-filled community. I mean, the spirit of God was filling them and he was doing crazy things that were so far beyond anyone's human capacity or capabilities. And they were in awe of what was happening. And I guess I just wonder sometimes, like, man, are we in just awe? Like, are we just so devoted to the Lord and to his kingdom that we're experiencing the supernatural work of God, the transformative work of God? Sometimes that could be physical, I don't know, physical healing, those sorts of things. That's what was happening with the apostles back in the day, but many times that's just transformed lives. Like God is doing something. And so this was a spirit-filled community, so much so that they were in awe. Uh, I read this quote uh, last year when we were in a series called One Another, but I, I thought I would read it again. It's significant. It says, commitment to Jesus is commitment to his body, his family. These are not two separate things, but one and the same. We're not just members of Christ. We are members of one another. Think about that for a moment. You are members of the person that you're sitting beside. In Christ, he has united us together. And he says we cannot commit our lives just to Jesus without also committing to the people of God. If we think we are totally committed to Jesus, we had better plan on an all-out committed a commitment to his body as well. Church is not about a weekend service. I don't ever want it to become like that for us as a church. It's about an everyday lifestyle. This is about doing life together, supporting each other, encouraging one another, uh, rebuking one another, uh, lifting one another up when we're down. One of the reasons why we come together on Sundays and we're going to do this at the end is just to pray together because, you know, some of you walked in here today and you're just kind of like, man, I just, I got nothing left. Like there's not much energy left in the tank right now. And all you need is you need the hands of God's people on you, praying for you, speaking truth into your life, and it's going to lift you. Pray all to the glory of God. Amen. Amen. So this was a community that was everyday, generous, devoted, spirit-filled, much different than a lot of people treat church today, which is sort of like, hey, I want to get it done on Sunday and then get on with the other things. Uh, to flip over with me, if you have your Bibles or you have something, uh, to 1 Thessalonians. And I just want you to see the image that's given here, of another picture of the church. This is the Apostle Paul writing this. He's talking to the church in Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And he's remembering when he came to them and he built relationships with them. He started this church and he 
lived in relationship with them for a while. And it says in verse 7, we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our own selves, our own lives, because you had become very dear to us. Stop there for a moment. He's saying, look, we came to you to share Christ with you. And as we started to share Christ with you, we didn't just share Christ, but we shared our lives with you. We served you like we lived together, we celebrated together, we enjoyed, we laughed together, and we struggled together. It wasn't just the gospel, it was our lives. Verse 9 For you remember, brothers and sisters, our labor and our toil, we work night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses in in God also how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you, encouraged you, and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And I could just keep reading, but he is describing not an evangelistic service that people come to once or on the weekends. He's saying like we lived life together as we shared the gospel with you. We were like a mother and her child, so affectionately affectionately desirous of you. We just loved you. And we were like a father and his children, just like directing them, knowing them. I'm I'm just thinking right now, uh, this wasn't in my notes, but thinking about some of the relationships that I have with people right now that don't know the hope of Jesus. I mean, they don't know. One one reached out just a couple days ago and he said, hey man, can you give me some guidance and direction on something? And I, you know, was texting him back and I'm doing everything I can to make something work for him. I don't want to get into the details, but something work for him just because I love him. Like I I am affectionately desirous of this guy. And if he never trusts Jesus, I, I I just hope that I can... I would still love him regardless of that. Him and he's married to a young woman. Both of them are young. They just had their first child. So my heart is just desirous of them. But at the same time, I want them to know the hope and the truth of Jesus Christ. And so those go together. Uh, This is life Together is what Paul was saying, and as they came to faith, they lived in this sort of way. Uh, The kingdom of God is like a family, a mother nursing her child, a father exhorting, encouraging, and even imitating for his children. The word imitate, he uses a little bit longer, that like we imitated for you what it's like to walk with Christ and to be with him. Can I just uh, say a couple words about prayer for a moment? I was uh, in Canada this past week, but also about a month ago, because that's where I grew up, and honestly, where we go is my favorite place on earth. This is close second, but um, it's just a a place to get away, and you know, me and my brother, we've we've got a boat, and so uh, we get to do a lot of the boat stuff and water stuff, but it's just peaceful, it's quiet, it's the place that some 35 years ago, I came to life in Jesus. It's the place that I trusted him. Like, I I, I just, Jesus, I I understand that I'm a sinner. Even like as a nine-year-old child, I got that. And I can't change this. And so I'm just trusting in you, Jesus. I know that you love me. And that has changed everything about my life, right? Like it changed where I went to school. It changed the woman I married. It changed the, how I raised my kids. Like I'm so grateful for this blessing in my life. And so I was up there about, I don't know, a month ago and uh, I was just um, trying, I was doing a study week and I was trying to read through the New Testament, starting at the book of John. Because sometimes it's just good to see it all together, and there were a couple things that just jumped out at me 
there was a number of things that jumped up, but you know what one of them was? How much prayer is central to their lives. Like this was not pray before a meal and, you know, kind of join a meeting once a week. It was like Paul is just like, just listen to what Paul says about prayer. Romans 1, 8 through 10, he says, first, I I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because of your faith is being reported, because your faith is being reported all over the world. God whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his son is my witness. So Jesus is going to give witness to this, he says, of how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last, God's, by God's will, that, we may be, that uh, the way may be open for me to come to you. Uh, But he's just saying, look, I'm constantly praying for you. And if you just read through all of his letters, rarely does he start a letter without saying, like, I'm thanking God for you, and I'm praying for this in your life. Like, constantly. I was reading this book this past week. Some of you may know this from, I think, maybe from the 90s. The, The book is Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire, and it talks about what happens when the Spirit of God invades a church like the Spirit invaded the church in the book of Acts. And by the way, that's where we're going this fall. We're going to the book of Acts, and we're going to go through it with lenses to see the Spirit of God at work. And what happens in a church when they're just hungry for the Spirit of God to move in their lives, right? That's where we're going this fall. I, I'm, I'm, I'm stoked. But I was reading this book from Jim Cimbala and tells a story of, of uh, uh, Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Tabernacle, where he became the pastor. Pretty funny. Um, first, one of the first pastoral gigs he had, if you can call it a gig, um, he's standing in the front of this church and he's preaching and there's about 10 people there and he's saying it's just sort of a disaster, things are... <laughs> going on, but he's being faithful to preaching, and uh, the, you know, the, the, the pictures are falling off the walls to this church building, and right in the middle of his final call to the people, the front pew cracks in half, and about five people on it, you know, fall down on the ground, and he's just like, holy cow, like, what is going on here? And he just continues on, but through the book, he tells about the Spirit of God that transformed a church that was broken down into uh, a place in New York City that they were literally going into Madison Square Gardens and singing the gospel and packing out the house. And his whole point is that there's nothing that's going to happen like that without the Spirit of God. In fact, this is to quote him. I will read this. He says, I want to, in fact, he came to the congregation one day in the early years, probably when it was under 100 people. And he said, I want to say to you today, from this day on, the prayer meeting will be the barometer of our church. What happens on Tuesday night will be the gauge by which we judge success or failure because that will be the measure by which God blesses us. If we call upon the Lord, he's promised in his word that he will answer He will bring the unsaved to himself. He will pour out his spirit among us. If we don't call upon the name of the Lord, he has promised nothing. Nothing at all. Uh, When we think about life together, we're not just talking about getting together in the club with people that we love and support one another. We're talking about going to war together in the spiritual realm for the hearts of our children, for the lost around us, for ourselves in the brokenness and temptations of this world. Do you understand? Like, we do not have the same father that we were born with. I'm speaking of in spiritual terms here. We were born with a father. He's called the father of lies. He's represented in Scripture as Satan, and uh, uh, he is Satan. I don't want to mislead you in that. 
but he has an entire army, and it says that he is the father of lies and that we were born into him. We were born into sin. But in Christ, we were born again, and we have this new daddy. All of us. Like, we get the same dad. I don't care what language you speak or what color your skin. Like, we get the same papa. And... Uh, so we come together as a body, and we do life together. We go to war together. We support one another. We encourage one another. But if nothing else, we pray together, right? They prayed together for one another, and they saw the kingdom of God at hand. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 16 says this, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together, contend together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints so that by God's will, I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Uh, man, there is nothing better than the kingdom of God represented by the people of God loving one another and joining together to love our neighbors for the glory of God and the hope that is set before us. Amen. Let me just give you a couple principles to close. What does this look like today? First of all, relational involvement in a local church. Let me state that again. Relational involvement, life together in a local church is not an amenity. It's our responsibility if you're part of the family of God, he's not looking for a service. And I, I, like, I don't want to stop you from coming to the service. That's not my intention. And I'm just saying that what he's looking for is the kingdom of God to take root here where we live life together, supporting one another, loving one, working towards our differences in our, you know, we get frustrated with one another. Well, so did the New Testament church. He's like, work towards the bond of peace. Like you are bonded together as brothers and sisters in this bond of peace. And you have to step into these relationships. You have to step in to a group or into an environment where I can actually have relationships because you can't have relationships from a distance. So relationships in the in local church, relational involvement in local church is not an amenity. It's not like, oh, yeah, we get to do that. It's our responsibility. Second principle, final principle. The smaller we get, and I'm talking about in groups, in relationships, the smaller we get, the deeper we get. Okay? We can come together here, we come together here, and there is critical things that are happening in part of the church here today. But there are some things that will never happen here. There are some things that I won't share with you all that I will share with one or two or three or five. And so if, if your church experience is only in the broad community, you are missing out on critical parts to life together in the body of Christ, encouraging one another, exhorting one another, supporting one another. And so we have three types of groups. We've got men's and women's groups, I guess you could also say small groups for the youth, but men's and women's groups, and these are groups that are formed based upon DNA, discovering God's truth, nurturing each other through the difficult moments of life, and helping each other to act upon the truth so that we're not just learning information, but it's leading to transformation. These are groups of three to five people, same gender, that get together and get real about life and encourage each other through prayer and keep each other accountable to grow in life. With men's and women's groups, we also have neighbor groups. Neighbor groups are larger groups, um, individuals or families that gather together in homes to love one another 
and to love neighbors, bless neighbors. And these groups typically will share a meal, they'll share scripture and stories, and they'll bless neighbors. And it's a lot of awesomeness because we're eating together and we're talking more organically uh, and we're supporting one another. In our group, we have had a lot of challenges and we have never called, to my knowledge, the care ministry of Valley Community Baptist Church. Why? Because we're in relationships such that we can care for one another. You have to step into those. And then we also have some, glasses, some classes or short-term groups like Divorce Care or like Moms and Mini, and these are great because they help to build connections and create community. Um, but I'm not here to tell you today you need to be involved in all of these because I don't think you could be, but I think you should be involved in some. I think if we're going to be the kingdom of God that is a reflection of what's going on in heaven right now, we got to be in relationships doing life together. Church is not a weekend event. It's an everyday lifestyle. I think, I was praying about this and just saying, God, why are, what, what's holding people back from joining groups? What's holding people back from doing life together? Three things came to my mind. Number one, busy. Some of you will say, I don't have time. We don't have time. And as your loving pastor, affectionately desirous of you, okay, um, every person in the world that teaches time management will say, you make time for things that are important to you. Okay, so if you don't have time, then I would just invite you to ponder that and say, God, is there something that I'm placing higher, more important than your kingdom that needs to change in my life? And this is a perfect time because we're about to go into the world, and so maybe there's some changes that need to occur. Some of you would say, maybe I'm too busy. Another would say idolatry. That's the second word that came to mind. Uh, I think that there probably are some of us that are worshiping the values of this world rather than the values of heaven. It's become our idol. And I don't know what that is for you, and I'm not about to try to detail those out, but it's a major uh, stronghold that Satan throws in our way and keeps us from living for the kingdom. And then the final thing that could keep us from groups this year is leaders say, I'm not ready to lead and what I mean there is that we need more leaders, and I'll have the worship team come, but we need more leaders that would step into leading, to building community and making disciples. Um, we have a, a pretty vast group that's saying we want to join group. We want to join community. We're looking for people to do life with. We want to do life together. Um, we can't put them all in one group. Otherwise, we're working against the very principle, the smaller, the deeper you get. And so I, I just want to pose it to you today. Who here today is God saying it's time for you to step up and lead? It's time for you to open your home. Maybe it's even just hosting a group in your home. But maybe it's making disciples. And we have plans to, dis to train you to disciple, to lead this, but we need some to step into it or to step back into it. Um, 